Francisco, welcome to Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour. This investigation is, is not a lawsuit. It is an investigation to determine the facts. 50 state attorneys general led by Texas opened a probe into whether Google's ad practices violated antitrust laws. We'll have the latest. Plus, linking up, we get an exclusive check-in with LinkedIn CEO Jeff Weiner. His thoughts on the company three years after Microsoft acquired the job listing site. And poised for disruption, from robots to supply chains and data, technology is changing healthcare. Our week-long series, Wired for Health, explores big changes coming to medical technology and how to invest in it. But first, to our top story. A group of 50 attorneys general opened up a broad investigation into whether Google search and advertising practices violate antitrust laws and harm consumers. State attorneys general, led by Ken Paxton of Texas, said Monday that they are investigating whether the search giant's business practices are harming competition. This investigation is, is not a lawsuit. It is an investigation to determine the facts. And right now we're looking at, at advertising, but the facts will lead to where the facts lead. Monday's announcement closely followed one from a separate group of states on Friday that disclosed an investigation into Facebook's market dominance. To discuss, I am joined by Sally Hubbard, Director of Enforcement Policy at the Open Markets Institute. Prior to that, she served as an Assistant Attorney General in the Antitrust Bureau of New York State. And in New York at Bloomberg Technologies, Garrett Devink, who covers Google for us. So Garrett, let me just start with you. Today felt like a big deal. How big of a deal was this? Yeah, I mean, I think it was pretty Pretty impressive to see that there was 50 attorneys general not all 50 states California and Alabama are conspicuously missing we'll have to see what ends up with those two states but I think the political tone that the attorneys general really wanted to strike today was that this is a group of lawyers who represents the entire country we saw AG speaking from states like Montana Arkansas Alaska you know places that are not urban that are not not necessarily on the coast and are not necessarily host to these large tech companies but do host a lot of small businesses that need the internet and need Google's advertising to get in front of people and to build their businesses. And so the, the political tone here is that this they want it to seem like a big deal. They want it to be a large, national, bipartisan investigation into this company. Sally, what was your takeaway from the press conference today? You know, I think it's a huge deal in this divided time in America to have 50 state attorney general. I, I know there was also uh, two states that were holdouts, but to have... 50 different attorneys general who are from both sides of the political spectrum join together and give this long in-depth press release where press announcement where they explained all of their concerns I think it's a very huge deal um, and it signals a new era for antitrust enforcement against big tech. Sally, comment on me on a point that you just made. This is a bipartisan issue. This was not just Republicans, not just Democrats, both aisles. Is that what is most concerning here from big tech's perspective? Yeah, they should definitely be concerned. I mean, this is a powerful coalition. There, it's hard to get things done in policy in America right now because this country is so divided. But this is one issue where they're all joining together and sharing the same concerns about small businesses being able to have a shot at reaching customers, about Google unfairly increasing the cost and you know, using its search monopoly to favor its own websites. Garrett, a lot of state attorneys general came out and said, and I'm quoting here, we support free markets, we support innovation. Is Google here really stifling that innovation in free markets? I mean, Google would definitely say that they're not. Google would say, you know, we built this amazing advertising product that allows anyone to reach anyone else in the Internet. And, of course, that's kind of how it started for a lot of these businesses that, that, that use Google and that use the Internet. But at this point, more and more of their, them are saying, you know, they're having to do things like pay more and more money each year just to bid on their own brands, on their own names, maybe even trademarks that they own. They need to pay Google to make sure their ads show up when someone searches for that trademark instead of a competitor. And so you're hearing more and more 
before. Uh, it started out as a lot of grumbling, and maybe you could say, okay, well, you can dismiss some of that. But as more and more of these businesses are saying, look, this is not working for us anymore, this great product that allowed us to reach people before has sort of become a trap. It's become something we can't avoid, and we have to keep paying into just to stay afloat. You're starting to see the, the wind shifting a bit here. Sally, one interesting quote for me from the Florida State Attorney General said, the service is not free if we are sacrificing data. Do you agree? Definitely. There's been a big deception on the American people that these Internet services are free, both Google and Facebook. And when we're under constant surveillance and we're actually offering up data that is highly valuable, we're paying a very high price. And in fact, there are some economists who said in a functioning market that was competitive, we would actually be getting paid for how much data and valuable um, information we're giving up in exchange for what we're getting in return. So Sally, talk to me more about that data. So often on this program and in broader conversations, we talk about a monopoly and antitrust issue and a data privacy issue. Did today's action do a good enough job of separating the two given monopoly and data privacy are two separate issues? I don't believe that there are two separate issues. I think we're seeing a real convergence of privacy and antitrust. Uh, the reality is that when these tech giants don't have competition, they're able to extract monopoly rents of data from users. So I think there's a real convergence. And the other issue is that data is a huge competitive ad advantage. So as these companies are doing acquisition after acquisition, that gives them unique data sets, they're creating barriers to entry for competitors and really fortifying their monopoly power. But Sally, how else would they be able to compete with Big Check in China, let's say? You know, I'm really not so worried about China. I think that's a bit of a red herring. I'm much more worried about American businesses having to pay a tax just to be discovered on the Internet. I mean, in the recent hearings, uh, Representative Cicilline asked Google if it's true that 50 percent of clicks 50% uh, of searches go to Google websites. And Google was not able to give no as an answer to that question. So what we have is Google taking over the internet because of it has such a huge monopoly share that it's able to prioritize its own websites at the expense of every other business in our economy. So I'm really just not that worried about China. Garrett, one of the legal barriers here is talking about how the consumer is harmed. As we've said, Google is a free service for consumers. What's the case that can the consumer here is being harmed? Yeah, I mean, like Sally said, I mean, a lot of people are arguing that by giving up our data as consumers without necessarily being paid back for it or, you know, in a fair way, then that's the harm right there. But I think what's interesting here is that that is something that Google and, and, and other large tech companies have sort of said for a long time, and in the United States at least, have been able to push off some of these investigations because at the end of the day, the services did were free for the end consumer. But there's also a consumer that buys the advertising. Right, a small business that needs to bid on on a, a, an advertisement so that people can find them online is a consumer of Google's uh, products, and that is kind of what the regulatory legal establishment in the United States has sort of realized and come around to that perspective that there is potentially consumer harm in this case, even if Gmail and Search seems free for the end user. Well, an, an investigation that is ever developing. Thank you to Sally Hubbard with Open Markets Institute and Bloomberg Technologies' Garrett DeVink. Thank, Thank you. you both. And shares of Netflix spiked on Monday. Give credit to the latest season of Stranger Things. Bank of America says Netflix has seen a significant reacceleration in downloads for its app. The bank attributes that to the third season of Stranger Things. It's a science fiction horror web series. Netflix shares had fallen more than 20% since July. And coming up, Apple under fire. Right before its big iPhone event, the company confirms it violated a Chinese labor law. What this could mean for its relationship with Beijing next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen to us on Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg.
WeWork still hasn't hit investment grade status yet, but the shared office space provider might take a cue from Netflix by relying on junk bonds. That's according to a WeWork executive. WeWork is currently unprofitable and has a corporate credit rating of B from both Fitch and S&P. Now another big story that we're watching is all about Apple and Foxconn. They did confirm that they broke a Chinese labor law while building iPhones. Bloomberg has learned that the companies used too many temporary workers in the world's largest iPhone factory. The claims come from an advocacy group known as China Labor Watch. The group says it's found other labor rights violations by Apple partners in the past. To discuss, I'm joined by Tom Forte of D.A. Davidson. Tom currently does have a buy rating on Apple and also with me in studio, Bloomberg Technologies, Mark Gurman, who covers Apple, of course, for us. So, uh, Mark, Apple confirming that the report was true. This a big deal? Yes, it, it is a big deal because Apple for years has been saying that it's at the top of its game, top of the technology industry, the industry world in general of treating workers fairly. And of course, in their statement, they say they do. But in this case, you know, they and Foxconn are saving quite a bit of money by employing these temporary, what are known as dispatch workers versus full-time workers year-round. Tom, does this move the needle for you at all when it comes to Apple stock? Sure. So I do think it is disappointing, and I would agree with Mark in that regard. Uh, it is unfortunate that Apple chose to use so many temporary workers to make its iPhones. Uh, stepping back a minute, though, when I think about the current challenges facing consumer technology companies, especially on the tariff front, I do think Apple's kind of in a class by itself to the extent that it's one of the few companies that's so big that it can lobby both the Chinese government and the U.S. government. But I do think it is disappointing that they would use so many temporary workers for making their iPhones. So Mark, Apple confirmed the claims. What do they do now to perhaps then fix the problem? Well, so what Apple said, and I, I totally believe this to be true because they've shown it in the past, when they see challenges in their supply chain, when they see issues, they see they're breaking a law here, which they are, they're going to rectify it. And so they don't want another report like this coming out again. So from what I understand, they're going to be working with Foxconn to, to fix this. This is something that's already being in the process of being repaired. China law states that you can't have more than 10% of your workforce being temporary workers, but Apple was at 55%, down to 50%, now to about 30%. So instead of that going back up to 50% again, I would imagine that's going to come back down closer to 10. Tom, how much of this is also confusion about the general supply chain in China, given Apple is in the front battle of U.S.-China trade fights? Yep, so I do think for any uh, multinational consumer electronic company sourcing out of China, these are challenging times. Uh, we just had our 18th uh, consumer technology conference in New York, and some of the companies that were participating were saying basically, the challenge in today's environments is you don't know what the rules are from a tariff standpoint. Uh, any day you could find out that tariffs are 10 percent, the next day you could find out they're 25 percent. So I think what you're going to see over time is more companies moving their supply chain out of China. For Apple, that may not be a great opportunity, uh, but I think in their case what you'll see is a lot of their suppliers move their production out of China, and I think Apple is going to try to continue to navigate the challenges including uh, tariffs as it pertains to its supply chain. Well, and Tom, we know that China needs Apple, Apple needs China, but is this part of what we'll start to see? More red tape, more difficulty of U.S. tech companies over there in China, and that's China's way of pushing back? Uh, I do expect that there will be pushback from the Chinese government if more companies, in fact, move all their supply chain efforts outside of China. I haven't yet figured out what that counter move would be, but I do think the Chinese government, generally speaking, is operating from a position of strength, given that they're a large net uh, exporter to the U.S. And I do think this is a challenge that's going to take some time to unpack. But I think in the case, again, for Apple, they're kind of in a class by themselves. They're of such size and importance to both the Chinese government and the U.S. government they have the ability to lobby both sides, and I think that puts them in a relative envious position. And Mark, how easy is it now that we've been talking about trade, we've been talking about tariffs really since early to mid-2018, how easy is it now to move some of that staff to other locations outside of China, Vietnam? 
Right, in terms of the equipment, moving the equipment, moving the lines, it's actually quite simple. Uh, one person at Apple who works in the supply chain described it as being able to sort of co copy and paste the, the equipment, the different lines from one factory in another country. The problem, and Apple CEO Tim Cook has hinted at this in the past, is the skilled labor. It's the people. It's having the amount of people. It's being able to essentially build an iPhone production city. That part is more difficult. Tom, we are all heading on over to Apple's big product launch tomorrow. What's the biggest thing you need to see from them tomorrow? So basically, I think they're in a unique position. So historically, when have we been, you know, when have expectations been so low for a new iPhone product launch? I would argue in its history, never. So I'm almost more interested tomorrow to find out the pricing of Apple TV Plus than I am to find out the feature set for the next generation iPhones. Why is that? Because next year we're looking for a 5G device from Apple. I do think working in its favor going back to tariffs, you may have consumers that will be rushing to buy this generation's device uh, in anticipation of paying 10% plus more for next generation solely because of tariffs. But again, I think for new product news for Apple tomorrow, I'm more interested in the pricing on Apple TV Plus than necessarily anything specific to the iPhone. Mark, do you agree? Uh, you know, the iPhone, I, I agree, expectations are low, mm -hmm. but I actually think some of the new features around wireless charging, shadow resistance, waterproofing are going to be quite exciting. What we won't get until next year is a new design, 5G, and new 3D cameras for AR. Wonderful. Tom Forte of DA Davidson and Bloomberg Technologies. Mark Gurman, thank you both for joining me. All things Apple. Coming up, delivery game on. Luxury e-commerce platform Verishop is ramping up its competition with Amazon by shaving a day off its free delivery service. We bring you the details with Verishop CEO Imran Khan next. This is Bloomberg. Is two-day free shipping speedy enough for the average consumer? Verishop does not think so. That's why it has now announced a new free one-day shipping for all purchases on its platform. Verishop is even going one step further, allowing all customers to benefit from this without a membership fee, subscription, or minimum purchase. But is it enough to compete with the e-commerce giant Amazon? Let's discuss. Verishop CEO Imran Khan, also the former chief strategy officer at Snapchat maker Snap, Imran, great to have you. So news of the day, one day free shipping, why the change? Yeah, I think in our company, we believe customer first, employee second, and shareholder third. And we are maniacally focused on how can we make our customer life better. And we launched our services with two day free shipping and we saw the positivity from our customers. And we wanted to things, make things better and that's why we launch free one day ship shipping. So it will get to you in one day business day. It will be shipped to you. So you say customers before shareholders. How are shareholders responding to the increased cost that this will cost the company? Yeah, I think, you know, if your customers are happy, they will keep coming back to you. They will become very loyal customers to you, and that will drive significant lifetime value of our customers. And the way we are orienting our company, we're a very young company, we are less than one year old, but the way we are orienting the company and the way we are getting everybody focused on, it's the long term, and how should we think about the long term value of our customers. And we believe by delivering happiness to customers on a daily basis, by delivering the product faster, having the best selection, having the best quality and having the best customer support. Like for example, we put our customer support phone number on the top of the site. You know, by doing so, we, inc we will be able to increase the lifetime value of our customers and that's where we really focus on that. And if we do that, that will create long-term shareholder value for the business. Imran, Amazon and Walmart also have come out recently with free one-day shipping. How do you compete? Yeah, I think first of all, I think we have to recognize that e-commerce is a very, very large market. If you look at the retail sales in the U.S. is around $5 trillion, only 10% of is that online. So retail by far is one of the biggest market opportunity out there and online penetration is still pretty low. So we don't think it's a zero sum game. We think there will be multiple player who will serve the customers and we are really focused on how can we serve our customers better. We are focusing on categories like man and women fashion, home, beauty, we recently launched kitchen and we are just really focused on how can we service our customers better and we believe the market is big enough to multiple players to do well.
And are those types of consumer products, the different categories, the ways in which you think you're able to differentiate yourself from an Amazon? I think, you know, the way we think about the customers is throughout the customer journey from coming to our site to how they get the product. So when they come to our site, we make it incredibly easier for discovery the product. You know, we have things like responsible shop, which is sustainable, where you can easily find sustainable, cruelty, eco-friendly product. We have a lot of different filtering options to find great products. We also have a section called tastemakers, where you can find your favorite influencers uh, recommended product. Uh, from there to uh, we, we really stand for quality. We have a group of people who talk to the uh, different vendors and we source the product directly from the brands. By showing, by doing so, we guarantee that there's no third party sellers. So we guarantee the quality of the product, authenticity of the product. And then how we deliver the product and then how we provide the after customer support. So again, going back, we are really, really focused on making sure customers find all the premium product in one place and they get it quickly and they have a great experience if they have any questions. Uh, again, I, I think I keep want to go back. It's a very large market. Only 10% mm -hmm. of the retail sales is e-commerce. And we think there will be multiple players who will, will serve the customers better. What is the pressure in the room to be profitable? I think, you know, we are very lucky to have a group of investors uh, like Lightspeed who really see the opportunity and we are focused on driving the value for the customers. And, and then I think the other thing is, we really, really want to build a disciplined company. So I think anything that will not make our customer life better, we don't try to spend money on that. We really, really focus on customers. As a company, you have to make choices, and we are making choices for the customers. And that's, that's how we're building the business. That's how we're building the, or keep creating the orientation of the company. And uh, so we want to be profitable. I think the business can be profitable significantly. I know if you look at many retail companies are incredibly profitable. Uh, but again, I think our goal is to drive lifetime value of our customers. Quickly here, any plans to go public? <laughs> we're way too early. Okay, wonderful. Bear Shop CEO Imran Khan, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. And coming up, we get an insider's view of the latest antitrust probe into our big tech. Our conversation with Facebook's former chief privacy officer, Chris Kelly. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Technology. I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco. Back to our top story, the increasing probes into alleged antitrust behaviors by big tech companies. This time, Google was in the spotlight. 50 attorneys general opened a broad probe into the company's search and advertising practices. This followed Friday's turn of events. New York's attorney general announced she's investigating whether the social network was stifling competition. I sat down with Facebook's former chief privacy officer, Chris Kelly, to get his thoughts on these new probes. It was almost an Inevitable that that big technology would be in the you know crosshairs is too is too kind of tough a concept to imagine here. There's a lot of questions that have gone on in a number of different areas, and a lot of them are getting kind of swept up in an antitrust um, type of conversation. And there's challenges to that that we'll need to talk about. Um, but but more than anything else, like when when companies touch people's lives in so many ways, um, there's inevitably a question about whether they're always playing fair. And that's what this is. Now, this is the state attorney general's case mm -hmm. that's separate from the Facebook fine of $5 billion from the FTC. Mm -hmm. Does that show that that fine didn't do enough? It didn't go far enough? So it, it, there, there are some people in the state AG community who will argue that. And there's, again, different questions of privacy and antitrust. And the FTC and DOJ also, at the federal level, have an antitrust investigation going at uh, targeted Facebook and Google, apparently. Um, they haven't said that much publicly about it at this point. Um, 
Um, but, but again, the, given the effect that these companies have on the economy, it's a pretty natural thing for this to happen. And it doesn't necessarily mean that anything is going to, to, to occur from this investigation at the end of the day. That there's gonna, they're going to look at some particular cases now, and it's, and it's good that they're getting a lot more particular because a lot of the rhetoric has been, oh, they're just too big and too powerful. And that's actually not an, an antitrust argument. There's still the rule of law in America, and uh, you, have to, you have to prove a case, and you have to prove antitrust injury, you have to mm -hmm. prove all of these different things, and how competition is harmed. That's, the, the rhetoric's been vague on that so far. It's getting a lot more particular, which I think is actually healthy. So talk to me about if this feels a little bit too late. Facebook sometimes feels like we're on the defensive. During your time there and the conversations casually that you have within Facebook now, did they do enough to prevent this from happening, particularly with data privacy? Well, here, the, the, one of the key things that we did from the early days in Facebook was to engage with a number of different privacy regulators around the world and have co proactive conversations about what how the internet should protect privacy. And there were going to be disagreements um, that, that we were going to look at it in somewhat of a different way than particularly European regulators. Um, but we always tried to have respectful conversations about that. And we tried to build technology that allowed people to make their own choices. All of that technology still sits in the Facebook stack. And there have been a whole bunch of disputes over whether or not it's hidden, too hidden and everything else or whether the company should be doing more. Um, the company is very, very focused on, on these issues at this point. And, you know, Mark has been giving public speeches talking about how the future is private, um, that there's going to be a lot more control over how information is shared um, through Facebook and the, and the Facebook family of apps. And I think that you'll see that in quite a number of different technology companies. I think it's very good to have competition on that. Now, that's a different issue than right. in antitrust, like just a pure scale issue. And that's one of the things that's, that's being missed in a lot of, again, the rhetoric around um, this investigation that's being announced today and the FTC and DOJ investigation. You talk about the family of apps and Zuckerberg mm -hmm. talking about integrating more WhatsApp and Instagram. Is now the wrong time to be doing that? So I think that there's there are certainly competitors who don't want them to do that. Um, and that the, the classic statement about antitrust law is that it protects competition, not competitors though. Mm -hmm. So for a person using the Facebook family of apps, it's a very convenient thing and it's a free thing for um, them to be able to communicate across the family of apps. And that's one of the things that the company wants to continue innovating on the consumer side for. So a, a lot of these arguments about how innovation is stifled, you know, there are always issues with big companies. But, you know, if you look at Facebook and Google and Apple and Amazon, the level of innovation at these companies mm -hmm. is incredibly high. Uh, the, the, they're constantly coming with new products to market, new ways for people to organize their time and their lives more efficiently and effectively. They're competing against each other um, for a lot of that too. And so the question is, from an antitrust perspective, is are they engaging in any unfair competitive acts where they have market power? That was my conversation with Facebook's former chief privacy officer, Chris Kelly. And speaking of regulating tech companies, Juul is facing scrutiny from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. On Monday, FDA officials warned Juul that it may have broken the law by marketing its products as safe. The agency also sent a letter requesting documents about Juul's advertising efforts, especially as they relate to children. Acting FDA Commissioner Ned Sharpless tweeted that, quote, Juul has ignored the law, adding that, quote, we've also put the industry on notice. If the disturbing rise in youth e-cigarette use continues, especially through the use of flavors that appeal to kids, we'll take even more aggressive action. Coming up, the crossroads of medicine and technology. In our new series, Wired for Health, we'll take a look at how technology will change healthcare over the next 20 years and how investors can position their portfolios. This is Bloomberg. All this week, Bloomberg Technology is exploring medical technology in a series we're calling Wired for Health. Whether it be diagnosis, treatment, research, or investment, we will be looking at how innovation plays a crucial role in sustaining health. We begin with the future of health. So to give you some context, 21 years ago, we saw the first robot-assisted heart bypass surgery. 
Today, virtually every operation in the United States uses robotics. So where will the next 20 years take us in terms of innovation and disruption? Glenn Snyder is MedTech segment leader for Deloitte. He is here with new research. And what I loved about this research is we sort of talked about where we've come the last 20 years and then where we'll be by 2040. What will we see in the next 20 years? Yeah, great, Taylor. Well, by 2040, we expect the healthcare system to be fundamentally different than it is today. Uh, it's going to be one where the consumer really manages their own health care and controls their own data. Um, and it's going to be a system that focuses much more on prevention and wellness than acute intervention. And also that businesses are going to take on very different roles than they have in the past. So from your research note, my takeaway was the consumer is taking the power back. I have wearable devices. I have power over my data. What's the technology that's driving that? Well, it, it's the same technology that's driving a lot of consumer-driven uh, control nowadays. So we all shop online. We control our shopping experience, our banking experience. Consumers want to be able to control their healthcare experiences too. And so with that, um, it, it, it's a combination of sensors, pervasive sensors that are going to be in us, around us, measuring our health and all of the environmental data and then radically interoperable data, which means that we're basically going to be able to combine all that data and draw some insights from it and present that back in a consumer friendly manner. You talk about no more silos between biotech, big pharma, venture capital, how healthcare companies. How do you see all of those starting to come and work together? Well, there, there's a lot of collaboration. In fact, a recent uh, study that we did, research study, said that 80% you know, of med tech companies expect to be doing um, substantial collaboration over the next uh, few years. And so that's going to be part of the course. Collaborations within the industry as well as collaborations with some of the high tech players, uh, for instance, who are bringing great capabilities around AI and uh, data analysis that are crucial for this next wave of healthcare. So talk to me about AI. It's a big buzzword. I know a lot of people are waiting on 5G to help power some of the AI. Is that really the future? Well, a AI, let's put it this way. <laughs> Today, there are over 250,000 clinical studies that occur in a year. And there, any physician or any individual can absorb all that information. So the beauty of AI is that it can digest all of that data and make some sense out of it. So many times our health is a function of subtle correlations and a bunch of different biomarkers and environmental factors, and AI can pick up on that. On this program, every day it comes up about data privacy. In your world, what is the balance between big data and more data is good versus the chance then we're all going to get hacked? Well, it, I think the key is that people need to be able to control and give permission as to what they want to give third parties to analyze, right? So there's great benefit to society and to us as individuals to, to have companies that can analyze all this data, but we need to know what's being done, who has it, and how they control it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was Glenn Snyder of Deloitte. And if the future of healthcare is also being disrupted by medical technology, investment will evolve as well. ARC Investment has identified five tech-enabled disruptive platforms that should generate more than $50 trillion in business value and wealth creation over the next 10 to 15 years. They are industrial innovation, genomics revolution, next generation internet, fintech innovation, and mobility as a service. To talk about all of these, I want to bring in Kathy Wood, CEO of ARC investment in New York. Kathy, of those five that I just listed off, walk me through what will be the biggest disruptor. Well, of the five we think the most underestimated today is DNA sequencing. It's really the topic uh, you're exploring here today, Taylor. Uh, DNA sequencing is exploding, and we think if Illumina, which is responsible for 95% of all the DNA sequenced around the world, including China today, that if it uh, re-engages in terms of cutting the cost and price uh, well below $1,000 per human genome, that we're going to see See explosive unit growth. We think that uh, if Illumina were to be cutting costs 
uh, at the rate uh, we believe the technology will enable, 40% per year. Think about that. Healthcare, a, a declining cost curve, 40% per year. That the number of whole human genomes that will be sequenced will move from 2.4 million globally last year, and that's half of all the whole human genomes ever sequenced in the history of all time, to 100 million in five years when we believe the price will be as low as $100 per genome. So we're and going Kathy, to be, yes? Yeah, and that is a fascinating statistic, and I'm so glad that you brought that up. How important is that statistic for you as an investor, and let's say me as a consumer, getting that under $100? I, we think it's very important if we are going to start uh, analyzing each human genome in terms of mutations. So our body is comprised, or our genome is comprised of three billion lines of code, effectively. And uh, a mutation is like a, a programming error, and it is the earliest manifestation of disease. Uh, it can start when we're born. It may not uh, be full-blown until we're adults. Wouldn't it be nice for our genetic counselors, and that is what, a, a new job that is uh, developing some momentum here, to identify our mutations from one exam to the next and to identify cancer in stage one. That is the promise of DNA sequencing costs dropping to uh, $100 and even lower with time and the information explosion we're going to be able to take advantage of. So, Kathy, we fold this into your world of investing, and you have a genomics ETF, ARKG. We had a great graphic showing a list of some of your top five holdings. How do you or what do you see within these companies to allow you to take advantage of that next revolution that you're talking about? Well, Illumina, of course, is uh, the category killer in terms of DNA sequencing, and it's foundational to everything else that we believe uh, needs to happen. Invitae is one of the most important molecular diagnostic testing companies. It is driving down costs. Uh, its cost of goods sold in 2013 were $1,300 per test. It's gotten that down to $250 and offers it uh, commercially for or the test commercially for 450 to 500 dollars what we're seeing in vitae do now is very interesting they are offering tests free uh, to discover pancreatic cancer or huntington's disease or epilepsy more about those diseases and what what is happening is pharma companies so glenn talked about collaboration pharma companies are paying in vitae to deliver those free tests so that they can get the information anonymized uh, and learn more about these diseases so that they can find cures for these very difficult diseases. So lots of uh, collaboration among pharma, biotech, molecular diagnostic testing companies, DNA sequencing, and so forth. Kathy, within ETFs, I think a lot of retail investor interest who are your investors? Have you seen it within retail, or do you get a lot of institutional interest as well in this? Uh, we believe that, uh, well, it's across the board, and, and we manage uh, funds across the board. So we have uh, many retail investors. They really helped us start out that fund. Uh, and now we have institutional investors moving into our ETFs. It's very interesting to watch sovereign wealth funds who are, uh, are trying to learn more about uh, the health, health care systems and health care breakthroughs so that uh, they can improve lives for their own countries, uh, they are even moving into our ETFs because they can treat our ETF like a stock and it doesn't have to go through uh, a lot of um, due diligence uh, uh, to, uh, and go to the, the chief investment officer. These are uh, uh, younger advisors who are actually very excited about what we're doing. Wonderful, that was Kathy Wood of ARK Investment. And as a side note, as Kathy mentioned, gene editing, our Wired for Health series will feature CRISPR pioneer Jennifer Duna this Friday. Until then, we'll have many, many more guests and innovators providing the latest insights from the intersection of medicine and technology. And still ahead, celebrating a work anniversary.
Microsoft and LinkedIn nearing three years. We find out just how the coupling is doing. Our exclusive conversation with CEO Jeff Weiner next. This is Bloomberg. I have accepted the reality that an election is the only way to break so do, the deadlock. We do continue to follow all of the moves happening the out of the UK tied to Brexit. MPs are currently debating and voting on a motion to call an early general election. Blue, uh, Boris Johnson council. is speaking now. Let's they listen in. Two have accepted this reality in their own leaflets this weekend. <laughs> this weekend, they say. We need a general election now. No. 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 We need a general election now. That's what it says. And yet throughout the weekend, uh, the right honourable gentleman's cronies, together with those of other op opposition parties, have been trying to disguise their preposterous cowardice by coming up with ever more outrageous excuses for delaying an op an election until the end of October or perhaps November or when hell freezes over. In the dither, delay and procrastination that has become the hallmark of the opposition. Why are they conniving to delay Brexit in defiance of the referendum, costing the country an extra £250 million a week for the privilege? £250 million a week for the privilege of delay. Enough to upgrade more than five hospitals and train 4,000 new nurses. The only possible explanation is that they fear that we will win it, Mr. Speaker. I will win it and secure a renewed mandate to take this country out of the EU, a policy they now oppose. And that is the sorry tale of, the, of this opposition in this parliament. For the last three years, they have schemed to overturn the verdict of the British people, delivered in a referendum, which in a crowning irony, almost all of them voted to hold. In fact, Mr Speaker, they didn't just vote to hold it. Some of them even... I'll give way with pleasure to the Honourable Lady. Thank you for the Prime Minister for giving me way. I'm really pleased that he's chosen to, to give me an intervention. But he's here reading off the fact that the amount of money that is being spent going into Europe could pay for nurses and could upgrade our hospitals. If that's what she thinks, why doesn't she have a word with her right honourable friend in front of her and tell him to reverse his absurd policy of spending an extra billion pounds a month to keep us in the EU and we're spending a billion pounds on 20,000 more police officers on the streets of this country, Mr Speaker. Uh, uh, but, but some of them, the Liberal Democrats, also called for a referendum on our membership of the EU, and once they got it, and by the way they lost that referendum of course, they did nothing but try to overturn the result, arrogating to themselves the authority to decide which democratic elections they respect and which they reject. Now, Mr Speaker, the, where are they, the Liberal Democrats, there they are, they want a second <laughs> referendum. But they're already planning to campaign against the result. When asked, when asked whether she would implement Brexit if the people voted for it a second time, the party's new leader replied no. So every time the Liberal Democrats lose a referendum, they just call for a new one over and over again. And I, I must say, it turns out that the Honourable Member for Dunbartonshire East is the is, the, as it were, the new leader of the referendum party, the Jimmy Goldsmith uh, of our times. But they are, they are models of coherence by comparison, Mr Speaker, with the leader of the opposition. Uh, his strategy, uh, mysterious uh, as it is, 
uh, is that by some process he becomes Prime Minister, but he, he went but without an election. And that was against. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson speaking in Parliament. And joining me now to walk us through all of the Brexit related developments is Bloomberg's Tim Ross joining me on the phone. Tim, thank you for joining me. Can you walk me through, just give our global audience some perspective? What are we listening to right now? Well, this is Boris Johnson uh, trying for a second time to persuade the UK Parliament to allow him to go for a general election. Much earlier than planned. The next one's not due until 2022. But he cannot get his Brexit deal through. He cannot get his no-deal Brexit through Parliament. He has no majority, and he says the only way out is for an election. But he can't get that either. So, Tim, what is the future for Boris Johnson here? He is going to have to wait and be patient. Parliament will now, after tonight, when he's widely expected to lose this vote for an election, he is going to have to wait for five weeks before Parliament comes back again. And he'll try and regroup and come up with another plan. How does Jeremy Corbyn respond? Well, Jeremy Corbyn is the man now with more power, seemingly, than the Prime Minister in terms of timing that election. If Johnson wants one, he has to persuade the opposition under Corbyn to go for one. So he's fine. He's willing to wait and time it as he pleases, I think. Yeah, one... Wonderful. That was Bloomberg's Tim Ross. Thank you for joining me. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.